good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me into uh, this amazing conference. Thank you, Zach. Um, so uh, last talk, uh, I'm not going to be talking about uh, surgery versus uh, radiotherapy. I'm not going to talk about SRS versus surgery uh, for brain metastasis, but I'm going to be talking about back going back to the library and uh, doing some clinical research. So uh, my topic is uh, academic productivity and residency. Uh, and basically I'll walk uh, through my journey uh, in, in becoming an academic uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, so um, I work at King Fahad Medical City. Uh, this is my Twitter profile if you want to follow. And um, basically my tweets on neuroscience and academia. Um, and, um, for those who doesn't know me, uh, I spent 10 years of, uh, neurosurgical training and these are the institutions that I went to. Uh, I did the surgeon scientist program in Toronto where I extended my residency, uh, to do a master's degree. And then I went to Mass General, uh, for endovascular, uh, fellowship. So my research streams are mainly focused on, uh, clinical research within cerebral vascular and, um, uh, my other platforms is working with big data and social media, media analytics. Um, and also I started to work with AI and natural language uh, processing. And also I'm interested in protocol design and statistical analysis for systematic reviews. So like any uh, other uh, journey in, in uh, clinical work, uh, basically start simple and think big. When I decided to be in academia, uh, the, I got inspired by uh, doing an elective at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and at that time, I published my first uh, narrative review, uh, which was done with Dr. Lanzino. Uh, and it was published in the Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery. It's amazing, like right now, I'm, I'm a neurointerventionist. And during that time, um, uh, basically, I learned how to write and think in English, uh, know how to search the literature for cases, be familiar with the uh, journal uh, formatting, uh, using different softwares for references. And right now, with the revolution that I see with AI, it's just uh, it's becoming much easier to do uh, than uh, when I started. But it's very important to know it, to do it uh, like the old style so you can understand how to work and navigate through AI system. And after I publishing case reports and narrative reviews, I started to understand um, like the publisher, uh, the other side of the clinic, the academic work. Um, and when we look at, for example, neurosurgical journal, we have dedicated journals to neurosurgery, like GNS, Neurosurgical Focus, World Neurosurgery. And then we have general, uh, uh, like uh, general uh, journals that uh, multidisciplinary like stroke and JAMA neurology. And then we have the technical ones uh, for cerebral vascular and endovascular like Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery and Interventional Neurodiologist, uh, Interventional Neurodiology Journal. Uh, so uh, that time I was navigating when I, whenever I was doing a paper, like what are the articles types? What are the journals are interested in? Uh, for example, for the GNS, they have section in history, they have section in uh, opinions and case illustration. And after understanding that, uh, I was able like to target uh, certain sections uh, in journals uh, to get higher impact uh, publications. Like uh, in JAMA Neurology, we were able to get uh, a case report in Neurology, the Green Journal, which is a major uh, journal in, in neuroscience. We got also a case report within that. And then I started following journals. Uh, uh, like uh, sometimes they make announcement and call for a certain topic or publication and that topic for reviews. Um, for example, this morning I was looking at Tradition and College Journals and, and there's a call for papers on uh, artificial intelligence if anyone interested. So uh, before you start academia, one of the main uh, like steps that I think is essential, uh, and I always tell the residents to 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 uh, know the past before going into the project. Uh, and when I go to my journey, uh, when I started my surgeon sciences program, which was on subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, the first project that I did was looking at the most cited work in subarachnoid. 
Uh, basically, I looked at all the papers that were published in subarachnoid and we classified the articles on treatment, natural history, um, management. Uh, and then I started to notice where is the gap there by looking at uh, these uh, like databases of articles. Uh, and after that, I was just, uh, Mike? And after that, I started noticing uh, uh, that uh, filling the gaps with uh, certain research questions that matched with uh, my thesis. The uh, uh, other lesson uh, that I want to mention is that uh, you got to learn from the reviewers uh, and make all the comments that comes in from the reviewer part, uh, in a, like deal with it in a constructive way. I always saw the reviewer comments as like a catalyst for your research work. Don't take it as a deconstructive uh, way. And I will give you a research stream that I developed because of the reviewer comments. So uh, in 2015, 16, uh, I noticed like this huge evolution in social media. And I was wondering like why no one looked at social media in neurosurgery. And then I did a cross-sectional uh, study on the usage of social media in neurosurgery, which we published in World Neurosurgery. Uh, and that two papers that I did uh, got the editorial board attention and I got three editorial responses on it. And the chairman is telling me you should invest in investigating this research stream. And uh, I started uh, my project, which was Neurosurgery 2.0. Uh, this is a project that involves uh, social media analytics. So we developed like certain specific aims like evaluating uh, communications uh, with uh, social media, uh, neurosurgical online traffic metrics, using it for uh, in epidemiological studies. And it was amazing. Like we were able to explore any topic through social media analytics, uh, like understanding online communications and epilepsy, hydrocephalus and brain aneurysm. We also uh, went into education uh, we used Google Trends to see if there is a seasonal effect of neurosurgical uh, diseases. Uh, we looked at also visual media and YouTube as a source of information on neurosurgery. Uh, we looked also at uh, mobile applications. It was just unlimited uh, uh, supply of ideas and projects. Uh, predictors of reach and engagement uh, for scientific articles. Uh, so that research stream started from review comments and it boosted my academic profile very quickly. Uh, no IRB needed for these projects. Data is already there. And the beautiful part of doing that kind of work was it was a perfect, they were a perfect project to learn statistics because you're dealing with huge amount of data. Uh, so we can do regression and high, high level like uh, statistical analysis and you can explore any topic. Uh, the other lesson that uh, I learned through this journey is that the key is always a question. To learn uh, new technologies, to learn new skills, it's always about the question. The question is the driving force for you to learn new skills and research. So when I started the social media analytic uh, work, uh, uh, I didn't know what is qualitative research. And once I started exporting uh, these tweets and comments, I had to uh, like study uh, qualitative research and uh, download applications to uh, analyze them. And then with AI uh, came in with ChatGPT revolution, we started integrating our work with social media and using natural language processing instead of evaluating these comments through manual way, now we're using AI to analyze them, whether these comments by patients or physician are negative or positive. Uh, analysis is power. That's uh, definitely a major lesson. Uh, and uh, the more time you invest in learning any statistical analysis tools like SAS, R, or SPSS, it's going to give you more credit. It's going to give you more opportunity to collaborate with other centers. And I had multiple papers where uh, my role was basically uh, statistical. Transform what you do to research. Uh, this is something I always do whenever I sign up to a project. Uh, so uh, every time I say yes to an, an initiative or extracurricular activity. I just think about the research aspect of it. 
So I'll give you an example of uh, a project that I published based on extracurricular activity. This is a website that I developed for the residents in Toronto to note uh, the lectures that are presented in the academic half day. And uh, I was, since I developed the website, I was getting an email about the clicks and uh, visits by the residents to, to the website. So with these data, I was like, let me just put it uh, through visualization and see what's the trend of uh, the resident clicks on the lecture. And I noticed all these clicks were happening before the exam uh, during the academic half day. So we called that paper as a study in behavior for the neurosurgical residents. And we were able also to see a difference in the number of clicks uh, for lectures presented by faculty versus lectures presented by residents. And then when I signed up for the bootcamp, I also wrote a book uh, bootcamp, like a, a chat, book chapter uh, on our approach, how to do it. And then the biggest project that I did uh, within the North American Neurosurgical Society was the expansion of the Journal of Neurosurgery presence. So this is a project that I did with uh, one of my mentors in Toronto, Dr. James Rutka, who's the editor-in-chief. Uh, we designed a campaign based on our knowledge from social media analytics to boost the presence of the GNS on social media. And uh, I created a team led by me and I had multiple social media editors. And with this campaign, we were able to make the journal as the number one neurosurgical journal in very short time. Uh, total link clicks before the campaign was 2000. And after that, we went to more than 170,000 link clicks. That's within one year. And again, I kept thinking about how can I get this project published? So everything during that project was monitored in a prospective way. So we collected all that data and we published it in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. And uh, the interesting thing is that the Journal of JMIR had a higher impact factor than the Journal of Neurosurgery, which told me that this is a project that uh, we it was worth investing. Collaborative work, I cannot uh, emphasize that uh, all, most of the paper that I supervised had multiple authors because I want to give the residents and the students an opportunity to learn and gain insight into academic publishing. Uh, one of the most common questions that I get, uh, which should I focus on clinical or go into research? And my answer is always, you have to master, master clinical before going into research. So all the work that I did was actually mid-residency, like R3, R4. Uh, and I do, I always believe that clinical education and research is a sequential thing. So you cannot have a st strong research output without having a good clinical volume, good clinical infrastructure, and a strong education program. It's just a, a, like, I, I do think the jump is gonna be uh, non-productive if you do it that way. That way. Um, and so I always recommend uh, focusing on clinical for the first two years of residency or the first year, just to be comfortable with the clinical part and then start investing some time in, in research. Uh, learn when to say no. I like this picture developed by AI. I did not ask for Shema, but it came out. Uh, so this is a very important lesson uh, uh, that signing, when you sign up for a project, like never say uh, yes, just because you wanna impress the faculty or the researcher, just estimate what are the chances of failure? What are the chances of uh, this is gonna be a burden on me? So for example, carotid stenosis, uh, if someone asked me if when I was a resident, I want you to look at all the carotid stenosis in the hospital uh, from inception to now, uh, collect all the charts with images and clinical outcome, and this is a project, if you say yes to it, you're going to be stuck for three, four years without being it done. I can tell you this 100%. This is a project that needs a grant. It needs clinical coordinator. It needs support from the hospital. It's not an easy thing to do. And basically, you're just going to be wasting your time. But think instead, look at carotid stenosis as an adverse event for radiation. Small volume. Uh, low number of patients. I know I'm mentioning side effect of radiation here. <laughs> uh, 22 patients, for example. You can do a chart review. You can do a review about it. Uh, you look at uh, radiographic predictors of outcome. You can do, develop uh, interesting analysis, and it's, it's, it's it can be contained uh, during that time. 
mentorship, uh, something that I call it, uh, the guiding light. That's all you need. You need someone to walk you when you get an obstacle. And that's for me is the mentorship. It's not like teaching you how to do it and things like that. But whenever I had a problem, I always seek help. And um, I had many amazing mentors in Toronto and Boston uh, that completely supported what I do. And uh, we published all of us uh, together and we're still publishing like on a monthly basis. Uh, Goal-oriented authorship. Uh, the main reason I'm mentioning this point is that for, for the residents or the fellows who wants to do uh, academic work, every time you sign up for a project, don't think about your ranking in the paper. Just think about what you're going to achieve. Am I going to learn stats? Am I going to be helping with the writing? What do I want to improve? Sometimes I sign up for a project because I've never uh, joined or I've never used that uh, software, for example, or I'm interested in it because uh, I'm interested in the methodological part or the protocol design where I want to test my skills in it. So just think about it. And most of my projects, when I do them, I just always reevaluate what did I do, what did I achieve, and what are the skills that I gained. And, and that happened to me also as a reviewer. So uh, I review a lot of number of uh, papers uh, on a weekly basis. And my main goal was also to get involved in the review process. So recently, I just got appointed to be an associate editor for the Interventional Neurotheology, a leading journal in, uh, in my field. Uh, and that gave me an opportunity to upgrade my skills in reviewing and make the call for uh, like new scientific papers within my subspecialty. The uh, most important thing, uh, you have to enjoy it. This is something that you need to really enjoy. Like, don't deal with it as like, you have to do it because the committee is asking you to do it. You're not gonna enjoy it that way. You have to make it as a fun part of your career. So before residency, I know this sounds like very weird in a, in a medical conference, but before residency, I was actually involved in creative content writing. So I was a screenplay writer um, and I worked with NBC Group. We did 37. We did Bash Matash, and uh, I'm someone who enjoys uh, writing. And if you look at my academic record, uh, there are papers that are purely writing. There's nothing scientific about it. There's nothing medical. For example, the history of neurosurgery at the University of Toronto. This is a paper that I spent on three years, just looking at going to the library, looking at the archives, papers that were filled with molds and uh, dust and, and I'm just enjoying investigating, looking at the old pictures. How was the surgical practice in Toronto 100 years ago? So uh, I did that paper because I enjoy writing. And at the end, uh, uh, just look at your academic career pathway as like a very long distant goal that you want to achieve. Uh, there will be many obstacles and always think about the bright side and what do you want to achieve if this is something that you're going to really enjoy. And uh, thank you for inviting me.